When are you all taking the LSAT? Who's taking March? June? July? July? Okay, September? Beyond September? Okay, so all of you may or will definitely take the digital LSAT. July, the July test date, half of test takers get the digital format, half get paper and pencil. LSAC chooses and you don't get any advance notice. So I would strongly recommend all of you go on LSAC's website, familiar.lsac.org, and play around with the interface. If you can, do it on your phone, do it on a tablet. I'm recommending that you get a tablet if you don't already have one. I know it's an expense, but you want to prepare as realistically as you possibly can, because it's something new. LSAC's using a Microsoft Surface Go tablet, but the Samsung Galaxy tab is a bit more affordable and might serve your purposes adequately. But one thing you want to be aware of is that although it's on a tablet, you cannot write on the page. So you can highlight, you can underline, you can flag questions, you can cross off using their tools, but you can't draw freehand the way that you are right now. So if your strategy is reliant upon bracketing things or writing in the margins, that's not going to happen on the digital L side. You'll have scrap paper. You can write on the side, but the back and forth, it's not really the same thing and you're not getting any more time than you already have, 35 minutes. So just be aware of that. One thing I was thinking about a lot in terms of what to talk about today is order of approach and pacing on the logical reasoning section because games and reading comp, they're grouped. You no, know, if you invest a bit in the game or you invest a bit in the passage, that pays off throughout the rest of that grouping of questions. But logical reasoning, they're bite-sized and so they're independent from each other, which means that they should not carry across from one to the next. Like your understanding of 19 should not affect your understanding of 20. But unfortunately, it does sometimes if you're stressing out about 19 because things didn't click for you. If you were investing minute after minute in question 19 and you're not making headway, adrenaline starts to pump, your heart's racing a bit, and you start to worry about that throughout the rest of the exam. As you do questions 20 to 26, as you do future sections in the exam, you're still thinking about number 19. And so I want you to reframe your approach. You don't need to get every question right to get a great score. The people who get a 170, they're typically getting perfect, maybe minus one on games, minus three on each of the LRs, and minus three on reading comp. So you don't need LR perfection. I'm not saying you shouldn't try for it, but what I am saying is that you shouldn't feel too invested in any one logical reasoning question, especially because they're independent. What you can do is you can flag three to five questions in the section, the toughest ones, and come back to this later. I got a 175 and I still do that now. If I see a question, maybe it's a parallel or principal application that takes up half the page, I'll say, you know what? I don't want to deal with that right now, maybe later. If it's question nine, I might do it in the moment because the method of reasoning will probably be simple. But if it's 19, 20, 21, that's as tough as it gets. So given that everything's worth the same, why focus so much on that one question? Similar if it's science and you're more of a humanities pre-law person like I am, or maybe it's formal abstract language. You can get better at those, but in the moment, you don't need to focus on them. Maybe questions 23 to 25 are gonna be a little bit easier, and you can always come back to those tough ones later. Logical reasoning has a general order of difficulty, but not a perfect order of difficulty. So skipping around, coming back later is totally fine. One of the cool things about the digital LSAT is that you will be able to flag questions and you'll see at a glance everything you flag to come back to later. When it comes to getting better at those tough questions involving abstract or formal language, you know, they come up only every now and then. Most LR questions are more informal and real world relatable. But if they start using terms like antecedent and consequent, you're in trouble a lot of the time. Even if you understand the method of reasoning or the flaw they're describing, you might not recognize it with LSAC's wording. They use confusing wording on purpose, right? So one thing you can do is set aside every question that uses abstract wording. This is typically flaw questions and role of the statement questions. And so if you set aside all of those and do them in a row, you'll train yourself to define those words and phrases for yourself, turning them from LSAC's language into your language. So if antecedent and consequent are actually just referring to necessary and sufficient conditions, wouldn't it be nice to know that and not try to define it on test day for the first time? You can do that now. There's nearly 100 released exams. 
86 of which are numbered. And even if you were only studying from 10 of those exams, that would be enough to define all the words and phrases you need. But it's worth taking the time to do that, not just glossing over it and saying, oh yeah, I get it now and moving on. Or if you're using explanations, whether they're video or written, that's just one person's take on it. It's not the only way to solve a question. And you also don't want to be using those as a crutch. So they're great if you're totally clueless, you want to get someone else's take on it, but ultimately your own review process, actually looking up words online, you know, Google the word like define antecedent and you can see what it means, but actually taking the time to do that is really valuable. I talked about review already, so I won't go into it again, but I get, but I will say that analyzing the wrong answer choices and the patterns in the tricks they use is extremely important. One other thing I can talk about is confusing necessary and sufficient assumption questions. I was saying earlier about how sufficient how they'll often include a sufficient assumption as a very tempting wrong answer choice for a necessary assumption question. It's really important to distinguish between them. You can do questions by type, but sometimes they'll often lump all assumption questions together in the same category without distinguishing between necessary and sufficient, although they're asking for very different things. I view necessary assumption questions as being a very specific kind of must be true question. A lot of people will view them as strengtheners providing new information, but they're not. Whatever is necessary to assume for the argument is already implicit in the stimulus itself. A person who believes in the stimulus is logically committed to believing all necessary underlying assumptions. So for example, if we had a stimulus saying something like God created the world, then it is necessary to assume that there is or was a God at some point. You can't have the given stimulus that God created the world if there never ever was a God. So a person who believes the stimulus, again, is logically committed to believing all necessary assumptions. That's why using the de negation or denial test works so well. The correct answer choice, when negated, destroys the argument. You could actually test this out for yourself on a must be true question and you'll see that the same holds. How do you tell the difference between necessary assumption and sufficient assumption? You tell based on the word or phrase in the question stem. They'll use words and phrases that are synonymous with necessity. Words like depends upon, requires, assumes. They all mean necessary. On the flip side, sufficient assumption questions are asking for very different things. They're asking for new information that if true, will guarantee the argument 100%, leaving no ambiguity at all. So that's like if you wanted to guarantee that you were able to buy a $1 item, if you learned as new information that you had $100, well, 100 is certainly sufficient to buy a $1 item. It's not necessary. You could get by with five or 10 or 20, those would all be sufficient, but having $100 is sufficient. On the flip side, having the value of a penny is necessary to buy a $1 item, but it's not sufficient to buy a $1 item. So having the right perspective really matters. And you might ask, well, are there things that are both necessary and sufficient to assume for an argument? And the answer is yes. Having $1 is both necessary and sufficient to get the $1 item, but you know, a stopped clock is right twice a day. So occasionally you could get lucky if you confuse one for the other, but the vast majority of the time, it really matters which way you're looking at the argument. And so doing questions by type can really help both to just distinguish the difference between these two question types and then making sure that your perspective is correct for viewing each of them. But I don't want you to focus too much on doing questions by type because it is also important to make sure that you're properly understanding the stimulus. A lot, a lot of times I'll hear from students who say, I don't really notice patterns in my wrong answers or what I'm getting wrong. And then we see that they're already scoring, let's say, in like the low 160s or the high 150s. At that point, you might have a decent foundation in each of the question types. And so you don't notice any particular pattern. Or you might say that you're getting lots of flawed necessary assumption questions wrong. And I'll say, well, that's because there's lots of them to get wrong, right? Like those are some of the most common LSAT question types. So if you're getting them wrong, it could just be because there's a lot of them to get wrong. It's like a sampling bias. So instead, you might want to think about the method of reasoning in the stimulus and making sure that you properly understand it. So we could take a given stimulus and provide a wide variety of question stems to help us change how we look at it. 
So for example, let's say we have an argument that we should eat at this restaurant because it has a five-star rating on Yelp. We could ask, what would strengthen that? What would weaken that? What, would, what needs to be true based upon that? If, I, if we said, we should eat at this restaurant, it has five stars on Yelp, what might strengthen that argument? If so, a friend was making that suggestion to you. If there's like a lot of reviews. Excellent, perfect. So if we learn that there were a thousand Yelp reviews and a five star average rating, that would strengthen the idea that we should get, eat at this restaurant. On the flip side, to weaken it, we could say, well, there's only one review. Or we could say, the reviews are all from the restaurant owner's family and friends who maybe are biased a little bit. Or we could say altogether, we don't like the cuisine. We could say, if we frame it slightly differently, we should eat at that, we, we conclude that we should not eat at that restaurant even though it has five stars on Yelp. What might resolve that confusing situation, like a resolve the paradox question, if we learn the reviews were not a reliable indicator, that could explain that outcome for that situation. So playing around with your perspective, I think, is really useful to better understand the argument in the stimulus if the question-based approach is not working for you.